the range of <clears throat> staggering stupidity on display in Nadine Dora's show uh, on Friday is, um, well, it makes it compelling watching. Watch this and uh, look at the contradictions, look at the, well, I'll, 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 I'll make some comments along the way. Welcome back to Friday Night with Nadine. There's a battle on now for the soul of the Tory party and how to save it. Conservative MP and former First Secretary of State Damien Green is here to discuss all that and so much more. He joins me now along with Tiv and Kevin, who are sadly still here. So, <laughs> Damien, I'm glad you're here because there was a lot of media reporting about your seat and your constituency. And I have to admit that I read it and thought that you were standing down as an MP at the next election. Can you explain what's happened? Because you're not. You're still going to be an MP, aren't you? I hope so. Uh, I will be contesting the election for the seat of Ashford, as I have been for you know, the last 25 so years. So what happened? Um, well, Why was it reported in that way? My seat's cut in half, and uh, I went for one half of it, and I wasn't selected. Uh, and then I went for the other half, and I was selected. So I have been selected. I will be the Conservative Well, you could have been selected for both halves, could you? Uh, no, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> but it still would have been everything, more constituency. Everything in the right of your cake and eat it moment. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a full on cake. Eater, so. <laughs> so, Damien, uh, Partygate report. What's your response to it? Well, I, I'm only halfway through reading it, and it is damning. Uh, and uh, and you know, I, I see what Boris and friends of his like yours are saying, that basically the whole system is wrong and everyone in, individually involved is wrong. Um, I disagree with that, um, A, because I know a lot of them and they are straightforward people. Um, but also, uh, I do think that if... Well, even the one who had a party of his own? Well, you, allegedly. So, so you, yeah, allegedly. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I, I don't repeat gossip and rumours on television. Um, but uh, I, I think the, the systemic point is almost more important that uh, if you set up, and Boris was Prime Minister when this was set up, uh, a, a system to look at something and then report to the whole of Parliament, then only when it comes down against you do you say, this is all a kangaroo No, no, report. no. You come down and say it when it goes against you when the evidence doesn't back up well, what the findings yeah, well, are. Well, I've, I've heard the argument you just had uh, about that, so, you know, we could go over and that. three against one like. now. Yeah. There's something going wrong in our booking system. Too. Yeah, but, um, but I mean, genuinely, <laughs> I, think, I think that if Parliament sets up these systems and then says, oh, hang on, we, didn't, we don't like that, then we've got to check out the whole system, then we would have to accept, and it's a really serious constitutional point here, MPs always like to be judged by other MPs. Mm. If we are saying it is not right mm. for MPs mm. to judge other MPs on standards, mm. then, OK, that's a big and important discussion to have, not with the, with the heat that's, that's mm. happening this yeah. weekend. Yeah, um, I agree. But that would mean that we would need outside people to judge every aspect of the way MPs behave. And imperfect though it is well, we've already in that, that process that, though we're already well, doing well, it through it their own standards a, a and bit a bit we've gone and, and, and we're going down that road already and at every point we go down that road mps sort of say hang on um you know i mean i'm responsible to my constituents why is this person yeah but it's not because we're just so up ourselves sometimes just because we think that nobody externally actually understands us or understands our job or what we do aren't we kind of when we say that as mps kind of elevating ourselves above the standards that other people are held by, which is usually by the law. I think that's a, that's a perfectly good argument to have. And if Parliament wants to have that argument and say, OK, fine, we're going to hand over all our disciplinary and standards measures to an external body, then fine. But that's not the system we have now. And if we're going to change that system, let's do it in a calm and orderly way. But and you not... and I both know what will happen. We'll have that debate in a calm and orderly way, and then we'll vote on it, and everybody will vote to keep the status quo and to keep MPs marking other MPs' homework. Well, well, we know what will happen, well, Damien. Well, that's not true, because if we, if we did that, we would never have set up IPSA. To, to do we had to pay, set up IPSA because it was in the heat and glare of the expenses crisis. We had no option. But I don't think that... I don't think this is the equivalent point, because... Uh, I, I mean, you obviously hold, hold strong views on one side of, of the argument about uh, the Privileges Committee and a lot of, yeah, we will, do, we will debate it uh, on Monday and Parliament will decide what to do. But I don't think it's the point where the entire country, more or less, has said this must cease, which has happened over expenses. The country is clearly divided over uh, the, you know, what happened and, and, and whether Boris lied or not. And I suspect... 
although you know, Monday will tell us, that the majority of Parliament will think that as well. That, that the, you know, the system has come to a conclusion it can live with, which was not the same as, as expenses. So, as I say, I think that there is an important systemic point here about who disciplines MPs, who in the end, and, and this is where it, it really sort of hits the, the democratic rubber, if you like, the rubber hits the road, is who has the capacity to chuck an MP out of Parliament? Uh, should it be, uh, clearly it should be the electorate, um, but if, you're, if, you're, if you've got something that's happening in between elections, and we've got this recall mechanism now, but again, ultimately, it's the electorate in a constituency that does it, or should it be mm. some external appointed body? I think the time has come where we have to say that MPs actually cannot be trusted. They cannot do it. They can't do the job. And this report, I think, is is the straw that broke the camel's back. I think we now have to move in the same way that we moved to IPSA, to deal with our expenses and our pay. I think we now have to move to the legal system to look at behaviour and appropriate and, and potentially illegal behaviour. Because we can't hand it to the Met Police and say that's not good enough. I, th I mean, the as I say, there's an arguable case to, to say that MP shouldn't try and discipline themselves. Um, where I, I part company with what you just said is you've conflated the offences of attending a party, which was enforcing the law, and the different separate offence of misleading Parliament. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever accused Rishi Sunak of misleading Parliament. And we all no, know... because he was never called yeah. to account well, at this matchbox. Yeah, yeah, hang on, let me finish. <laughs> yes, and so therefore he didn't mislead Parliament. Boris did mislead Parliament. I, I don't That's, think he did. Well, all right, you can, you can disagree with the, the findings, but what that committee did, was it was asked to do, was to say whether Boris had misled Parliament. And they have come to a conclusion. They were not asked to um, judge whether Rishi had misled Parliament because he didn't. And, and as you just said, he was never asked to do so. So, uh, and I suspect he wouldn't, but, but neither of us will ever know because he wasn't asked. So to conflate what the Met did and, and the whole cake incident with what the Privileges Committee did is, is just factually wrong. No, it's not, Jamie, because what I'm drawing, what the parallels that I am drawing is that the committee said Boris must have known, must have seen. We know that Boris and Rishi were working cheek by jowl. They were both fined for being in the same meeting. Whatever Boris must have known and must have seen, so must Rishi. The only difference is Rishi would have received the same advice that Boris received. He would have gone to the same dispatch box because it came from the same people. He would have gone to the dispatch box and said exactly what Boris said at the point that Boris said it. So you, know, so you want to convict Rishi for something he no. never did, but you say he would have done. I mean, this is no, ridiculous. No, and this one is absolutely priceless. I suppose one of the charges you could make against Rishi is that he didn't resign. If he knew that Boris was not telling the whole truth to Parliament, but yet he continued to to stand there as his chancellor. You know, his, re his resignation, for example, only came after Sajid Javid resigned. It, he does give the impression sometimes of not taking the strong position on these issues. He's a, the charge that he's weak by Labour. Yeah, well, I mean, Labour would make that charge. And, and it, there's always, there are always pressures on cabinet ministers. You're in the middle of a national crisis. Mm. Are you, are you, is your resigning self-indulgent? Yeah, or it not? might be, but, but, but I think, it, sorry, that's to, the only to, way that but, Nadine's but, point becomes valid. But, but, he did well, not resign. Like, I don't think like, Nadine's can, point still doesn't become valid because <laughs> you cannot accuse Rishi of committing an offence which he just didn't commit. So, I mean, so, so as I say, a, a, a I'm not, I'm not guilty. I am not accusing Rishi of being guilty of committing offence. I am pointing out, I am using that example to point out the ridiculous notion that a committee could put into a report that inside Boris's head, I mean, were they in there? What they thought he must have seen and what they thought he must have known. Damien, on this question of, uh, of mm. apologising, if do you think if Boris Johnson had admitted all the rules weren't followed. I know Nadine will challenge us, but I think it's pretty clear in the report they weren't. Uh, take it, take it, he's fine, apologised. Instead of misleading Parliament, lying, a cover-up, he could still be Prime Minister today. Yes. And that's, it's, it's a cover-up and the lies and the misleading that's cost him, not the fact that... But Kevin, he knew that. He, it was broken. Well, why did he, he do it? He knew that because he, he, because he refused to say... He, that he was guilty of something Nadine, that he knew he was not. Nadine, if, he, if, he's, if he's done that and it's the cover-up and the misleading, no, isn't he the author... That would have been a lie. I mean, you write a lot of books. Isn't he the author of his own downfall? 
That would have been a lie. If he'd done that, he would have been lying. So now stay with me, gentlemen, while I remind our viewers of a story I've been glued to for the past few weeks. ITV bosses were summoned before MPs on Wednesday to explain themselves over the Philip Schofield scandal. Let's take a quick look. We asked multiple times of both individuals, both formally and informally. And so we felt that was proportionate to what we had because we had no evidence. No one brought us anything tangible, either on the production floor or from the outside. There was only hearsay and rumour and speculation. We conducted all of those conversations at that time. No one came forward with any evidence. Um, straightforward categorical denials each time it was asked. And conversations continued also in um, May this year, right up to the day when Philip finally admitted that he'd been lying to us. I, I remember saying to him, look, you don't, you don't have to do this now if you don't want to. You don't have to do it on TV if you don't want to. He said, no, 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 this is absolutely the way I want to do it. I've been thinking about this. This isn't a sudden decision. I've been talking about this with my family. I've, I've, this, I've, it's just the moment now I want to do it. So I said, OK. Then there was a moment when we were alone. And I said, look, Philip, don't worry about ITV supporting you through this. It's, it's fine by us if you want to do this. What, though, is there anything that you want to tell me now? Is there anything we should know that has prompted this or that you want to share with us now? Because it's, it's fine, but we just don't want suddenly tomorrow or the next day to hear something we didn't know about and be blindsided by it. And he absolutely, you know, categorically said, no, there's nothing. This is just a private matter and I want to get it out there because I've been thinking about it for so long. So, Damien, did you get everything you wanted? Were you happy with the committee? Um, I think that, it, I mean, it's clearly very sad personally and, and I'm fascinated you say you've been riveted by it for weeks because... Well, I've I, got a column in the Daily Mail so we've been writing about it every yeah. day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, there's all in there, space to fill in newspapers. I absolutely get that. Um, but because I haven't been, I, you know, I don't watch the show, it's daytime TV, so I'm always too busy to watch it. I don't know Philip Schofield at all. It's clearly a very sad, personal mm -hmm. uh, story for him and also for the other man involved, who we all spent yesterday calling Person X, um, who's, uh, by all accounts, having a harrowing time being mm -hmm. followed around by oh. the tabloids. It's a, it's a fairly grim tale. I thought, to be honest, ITV obviously came very well prepared. And what we were interested in as a committee is, you know, can this happen again? What kind of protection are, is there, particularly for relatively powerless people at the bottom of the food chain in TV, mm. um, if they're being uh, basically manipulated by, you know, the senior editors, the presenters, all the people who have uh, the real power uh, in TV? And you know, they put up a performance saying, yes, you know, we've got all these things uh, in in place, and I mean the other half of it was about is there a toxic atmosphere and daytime TV uh, programs. But Damon, can I just come in on that? Because yeah. the reason why I said I write about it in my column is because when I moved into writing a column and, and into TV, one of the first things I heard about was the toxic working culture ITV, and they are a public service broadcaster, which is why they were at your committee. You know, I've heard about this culture through people in television, people who worked at ITV who won't work at ITV now. Are you satisfied? as a result of your committee, that, that that culture doesn't exist? The point about the toxic culture was put to them very strongly uh, by members of the committee. Uh, they strongly denied it. Uh, it's without you know, spending a week looking at it. Uh, it's, it's quite difficult to know. I think what's important from the committee's point of view and the way Parliament can um, ensure that these important broadcasters are behaving properly is to make sure that there is a whistleblowing system in place that there are ways you can report anonymously uh, if things are going wrong. And, and they said that. Now, if, if it's not, and if people are not using that, then because they have uh, public service responsibilities, they will have to report whether anyone is using their whistleblowing line or things like that. So we will see over time, but also more practically for pe people involved, I suspect they will see over time whether whether the atmosphere changes, if indeed it has been bad. I mean, I, I used to work in TV uh, before I went into politics. Um, and, and if you think politics is political, uh, you should see how political <laughs> TV is. Uh, it's, it, the, the politics with a small p is often much more vicious and much more personal than wow. it is in Westminster. Well, that must be way above my pay grade. So I, I hope you agree with me that this is um, utterly bewitching television, uh, whether you're watching it or whether you're invited as a guest. I mean, probably, uh, if you do it too often, you'd have to get drunk in order to be on there. But it's, it's bizarre.
It's bizarre and hypnotic television and utterly, utterly mad.